So today we'll talk more about uh, working with imbalanced data, uh, which we started on, uh, I guess, last week. So last week we talked about how to measure how well a model is performing if your data is imbalanced. Today we'll talk more about ways that we can uh, fix the model or change the model so that it might perform better. Oh, maybe a brief announcement. In terms of um, exam, a couple of people have asked me about the content of the exam. I'll be posting a practice exam, let's say by Wednesday at latest, and uh, the practice exam will have exactly the same format as the exam or the, the midterm. The midterm will be closed book, and um, basically yeah, it will be laid out exactly the same way as the practice midterm, so that should give you some idea of how it's gonna look like. All right, so quick recap on imbalance data. So there's mainly two sources of imbalance um, that we talked about. One is asymmetric cost, so that means that making a false positive or a false negative might have um, different business costs associated with them or just different costs in terms of um, uh, real world events. Say if you misdiagnose a person uh, one way or the other way, this has very different outcomes. The other is uh, asymmetric data, so very Rarely do you have the same amount of positive or negative samples in the data. Um, actually, a, a nice example for this is um, homework three. In homework three, you have quite a different amount of data for the positive and the negative class. If you want, you can apply any of the things we're talking about today for homework three, but you're not required to. Um, in homework three, the point is, even though the classes are very imbalanced, you probably have more data than you can use, at least uh, on your laptop. And so maybe it doesn't matter that much that uh, the actual distribution is imbalanced. Yeah, so okay, wh why is this important? In practice, neither the cost is ever symmetric, nor is the data balanced. Because th th this is our just so unlikely thing. So why should two different outcomes have exactly the same probability? Um, very rare. Um, very extreme cases are detecting unlikely rare events. Um, for example, people clicking on an ad, or if you're screening for a rare disease, or if you want to detect a malfunction. So in these cases, you will have very strongly imbalanced data. And so in these cases, you really sort of need to think about if only 0.01% of my data become, belongs to one class uh, versus the other, then um, yeah, you need to put into a little bit more thought into the whole process. The one thing we looked at last time in terms of um, how can we change the outcome was changing the thresholds. So if you have a probabilistic model, for example, like here logistic regression, um, I'm applying this to the, the breast cancer data set. Um, so you can change the outcome by applying different thresholds to the predicted probabilities. So by default, calling predict will apply a threshold at uh, 0.5. If class one is, according to the model, more likely than uh, 50%, then it will assign class one. And you can see here classification report uh, gives you precision and recall for either class being the positive class and averages. But if you ca uh, care more about um, recall for class zero than you call for, uh, about precision for class zero, you can, um, well, either be, you could say be more aggressive in classifying as class zero or be more conservative in classifying as class one. Um, so now we, uh, we change the prediction to be only uh, predicted as class one if the predicted probability by the model is greater than 0.85. So in this case, we will predict less ones, which means the precision of class one will go up and the recall of class zero will go up. 
So this is sort of a very simple way we can change the model. So well, well, let's recap ROC and PR curves very briefly. The other thing we looked at was um, ROC curves and PR curves that both uh, show how um, either a false positive rate in recall or a precision in recall change as a function of the threshold. And um, you can sort of look at all the possible operating points of your classifier by seeing what the trade-off is between two quantities, in this case for the rock curve, uh, false positive rate and true positive rate, uh, for each possible threshold, which will give you a much finer grained picture about, um, well, for comparing two classifiers. All right, so, but now let's actually try to um, change the model in sort of more interesting ways, or, yeah. Uh, the training procedure, I should say. I will use as a running example um, the mammography data set. Uh, so you can fetch this from OpenMML. You can look at, at the description and so on and uh, citations on OpenMML if you want. Uh, Scikit-learn since the la last release also has uh, fetch OpenMML which allows you to download data sets from OpenML which is nice. And so I will download this data set X is of this shape, so we have 11,000 samples in six dimensions, so three low dimensional, and they're all continuous. And the um, class imbalance is as, as this. So there's about, well, nearly 11,000 samples in class zero and 260 samples in class one. So this is actually, um, so the, the, uh, these measurements are from um, mammographies, so uh, breast exams, and uh, what it's detecting is whether there's calcium deposits in the tissue. And so these calcium deposits show up and they are often, um, I think the point is they're often misclassified as cancer, but they're not cancer. And so we're trying to detect these calcium deposits here. Here you can see a scatter matrix, so you can see there's um, this, the five, sorry, six uh, continuous features. So I want to emphasize, this is sort of a running example and just want to show you what it looks like applying the different methods we're going to talk about to this data set. This is by no means a benchmark. Actually, I'm not really aware of any good benchmarks um, for really exploring how these strategies work in the real world. Um, if you want a summer project with me, uh, feel free to talk to me about doing a benchmark for uh, strategies to dealing with imbalanced data. All right, so one thing, if you look at this picture that you kind of uh, need to be aware of that is that uh, depending on how you plot this, um, this data might it look very differently. Oh no. I changed, that's unfortunate. Um, let me really briefly fix this. Can I fix this live quick enough? Probably not. I changed the indices of the positive class from zero to one. Okay, I'll, I'll just give up on this and change the slide later. I don't think I can do it in time. Yes, yeah, so, so the plot on the left hand side shows the data set projected to feature three and four uh, with a random ordering of the training data set. And um, on the right hand side, uh, the plot is actually broken. Um, what you should be able to see if the plot wasn't broken was um, if you plot first all the purple points and then all the yellow points you can see much more of the yellow points. So the yellow points are the minority class and there's very few of them. Um, but there's actually uh, a whole bunch of them here that you can't see because of overplotting. So the order in which you plot the two classes matters a lot. I'm not sure what went wrong here because here all the yellow points are gone or maybe, it's, or yeah, I don't know what, what, what happened here. Sorry about that. So 
when I plot this data set, what we'll, I'll always do now is I'm gonna plot the purple class, so the majority class first, and then I plot the yellow class. And um, this will sort of give more emphasis on the yellow class. But it's very hard to really show this in a good way uh, in a scatter plot. All right, so here is a baseline. I'm using um, both logistic regression and random forest as a baseline. Just putting them into the data set, it's already actually, um, the way it comes is scaled in some way that's supposed to be meaningful. I'm evaluating it using um, Brock AUC and average precision. So I'm calling cross-validate uh, with my model, logistic regression, uh, training uh, data, training labels, tenfold cross-validation, and I'm using two scoring metrics, Rock AUC and average precision. Scores will now uh, will return a dict of the different scores over the different folds. And so I compute um, the test rock AOC and the mean overall the folds and the test average precision, the mean overall the folds. And you can see the rock AOC is like 0.92, which kind of sounds good, and average precision is 0.63. Then I'm doing the same thing for the random forest. And um, the ro test rock AOC is uh, 0.939, and the average precision is uh, 0.722. Okay, so random forest is better than logistic regression. Not very uh, surprising. And actually, the, the random forest results seem kind of reasonable. So I want to use this as basically just using all the bit. This is basically just using all the data and not caring about the imbalance. This is what we get. And so now I want to um, change the model building process and see how this changes. So there's two basic approaches um, to dealing with imbalance data. One is change the data and build the standard model. And the other one is change the model you're building. Or you can combine both. And uh, changing the data, you can either add samples or remove samples or do both of them. We'll mostly talk about changing the data and we'll talk a little bit about changing the, the model or using different kinds of models. So one issue with changing the amount of data is that scikit-learn is not very good at supporting it. In particular, if you use a pipeline, so this is sort of my ex explanation of the pipeline that we had before uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so if you fit a pipeline, you push X through the different transformations, you fit the transformation, you transform it with the transformer and so on, but the Y always changes, uh, always stays the same. This means that you, because the Y is always the same, it means you can't subsample the data set in a pipeline. There's other ways to subsample a data set, but it's kind of ugly. And so um, this is why we're not directly using scikit-learn for this. We're gonna use an extension of scikit-learn called imbalanced learn. And I always forget the D in the title. So this is an extension of the scikit-learn API. Actually, we're working on putting this extension into scikit-learn. Uh, we've been working on this for the last two years, so maybe at some point it'll happen. So the thing that it adds to the scikit-learn API is uh, what they call a sampler. A sampler uh, implements the following. Basically, you have this object, which is a sampler. You can call dot sample with the data and the targets. And um, this will change both the data and the targets. And so you can resample them in any arbitrary way. And usually you do fitting and sampling uh, in the same step with calling fit sample. So this allows you to oversample or undersample your data sets, so to drop uh, samples or to, to do other things. So, and if you have this in a pipeline, then uh, this is only done during fitting time, so at training time. If you, call, if you do predict or transform, this will not be done because you want to um, have the original data if you want to evaluate your model. You don't want to change stuff in your test set while you're calling, uh, while you're doing model evaluation. So this is only for changing 
the data during fitting. All right, so one of the most commonly used strategies and um, also a very effective one is random undersampling. Random undersampling means I'm undersampling so or subsampling the majority class. And a uh, strategy is to do that until the classes are balanced. So here in this training set, I have um, 8,000 samples from the positive class, or class zero, and uh, 390 samples from class one. And, sorry. Sorry, no, that, that was not, that's not what it is. Sorry, we had um, 800, um, sorry, 8,300 um, samples in the training set uh, overall, but this is very imbalanced. So if we subsample it, it will subsample it until it's balanced. Um, after the subsampling, the data set is much, much smaller, only 20th of the size. It's um, only 390 data points, and these 390 are 195 positive and 195 negative. So basically, this original data set had 195 um, of the minority class, and we randomly subsample until we also have 195 in the majority class, and the data set is balanced. And you can see how this is done here in this code. Um, with a random undersampler, replacement equal to false means the undersampling is done without replacement. And I can do, call uh, rust.fit sample, and this will give me the subsampled x and y. So clearly, this is a, a random procedure, and I randomly pick out the 195 data sets from the majority class that I want to keep, and I keep all of the minority class. Doing this until it's one-to-one -one is pretty extreme. We could also um, undersample less and say, okay, right now it's something like 40 to one. We can d go down to five to one and um, not undersample as much. Basically what we're doing here is we throw away most of the data. We, we throw away um, around 8,000 data points in the bigger class. The good thing about this is now everything will be much, much faster because um, we, we only have the 20th of the data set size. And so one of the main motivations to do this is not only that in some cases the model might get better, also you will be able to train much, much more quickly or you'll be able to train more complex models. So now I'm um, evaluating this. I have built a pipeline. so. Imbalance Learn also has its own pipeline that supports these, under, these samplers. And so I, they call it make pipeline, but to distinguish it, I imported it as make imp pipeline. To make imp pipeline of the random undersampler and logistic regression. And um, then I call trust validate with the same metrics. And so here is the mean uh, ROC and the mean average precision. So there are several interesting things going on here. The first is the AUC went up, whereas the average precision went down. And the average precision went down quite a bit. Um, so this is, I find this quite hard to interpret. And basically, it means that these two things are measuring different things. So is this new model better or worse than the old model? Depends on what you care about. In the end, you probably don't care about AUC or average precision at all, but you care about some other metric. So here, it's really important that you have the metric that you're actually interested in, because uh, depending on which proxy you, do, you choose, whether you, you choose the um, um, average precision or rock AOC, you get different answers on whether this model is better or not. Uh, as I uh, said last time, so in general, I would probably prefer um, the average precision for very unbalanced data sets. But um, there's not really a reason why AOC is not also a good metric here. Uh, what are the benefits of using the undersampler in a pipeline versus just equalizing the classes in your data set? 
that uh, the three classes to make that before you train your model? Okay, the question is, what's the benefit of doing this in a pipeline instead of just doing it before the training? And um, so this is only done for the training set and not for the test set in the cross-validation. Um, this is probably what you want to do. Some people also do it the other way around. But so here in this model, the for in this pipeline, the, in the cross-validation, the validation set has the original class imbalance and only the training set was made balanced. Um, this might be interesting because in the real world, your data will probably also be imbalanced. So if you apply this model to data, it looks more like the real world. Um, it's not, I think there's not a lot of literature on what is the right thing to do in terms of doing this, but um, this is the difference. <laughs> um, so another thing that's very interesting here is the, if you look at the um, AOC, it went up, actually up. So this model is trained on 120th of the data set and according to its measures, actually better. Even for the average position, it's like it went down, but it didn't go to zero. So I threw away nearly all of the data I had, but still the model is reasonable. If I threw away slightly less data, it might um, be as good. So this is something that's very, very common uh, in practice is that if one class is much, much bigger than the other class, you probably don't need to keep all the majority of class data because it's very redundant. And so you can see this here. Sorry, so this average uh, position is the position for all subclass labels, right? Is there a way that I could see uh, what the position is for a particular class? This is um, here both the AUC and average position are for the minority class only. Oh, okay. This is a binary classification task. And usually you're interested in the minority <coughs> class. Okay, we can do the same thing um, with the random forest, and we can see uh, quite similarly that the AOC went up and the uh, average precision went down. So the went down is it now about at the same level as the average precision of the linear model. So yeah, so one of the main advantages of doing this, or the main reasons of doing this is to make training much faster and also not to have to store uh, all the data. Um, another strategy that's very common is random oversampling. Here you do basically the opposite. You oversample a data set until it's balanced. So here, in this case, this means we basically double the data set size. So now training the model will be much, much slower because we now, we originally in this training set had 8,300 samples and we now upsample the minority class uh, until it's balanced. So then we have um, 8,100 in each positive and negative. So here oversampling means you just sample with replacement. So these will be points that were duplicated like 10 times or more. So he, basically you just add duplicate samples until it's balanced. Downside here is of course, this makes it much slower. And compared to um, the undersampling, we had here, we had 400 data points in the undersampling case. Here we have 16,000 data points in the oversampling case. Um, so this is something that uh, people do to balance data sets. So here uh, results both on um, logistic regression, random forest are not super um, exciting. They both went actually down. So, and I think they actually, um, well, this is the average precision went down not as much as with the undersampling, but basically if, if it's worse than not doing anything. So why would you do this? And it's more expensive. 
at least for this data set. You might have different ex experiences with other data sets, of course. So here is now um, comparing the rock curves and the PR curves. As we saw, the, they basically, the, uh, these two metrics disagree about what is a good model because they give different emphasis to different spaces in the, um, well, in, in this trade-off space. So here for precision recall, um, the original, the blue, is probably the best and it's above the rest for most of it. The, if you look at the ROC curve, actually I think the, this, this point here where they cross corresponds to this point here. Uh, remember the, did they share the recall axis? And so basically the ROC curve gives a lot more um, emphasis for these parts here where the green and the orange are above the blue. So here, um, overall, um, the green, the undersampled case was the best for um, area under the curve, for area under the rock curve, and um, the undersampled, sorry, and the original was the best for um, average precision. Okay, and here's the same for, for random forest, and you can see similarly that um, the uh, undersample is best for AUC, over oversample is pretty bad, and um, original is kind of reasonable. Um, for average precision, again, you can see, I think basically this area here where green is better than orange um, corresponds to this space over here. So if you care about this, this space, then maybe undersampling is a good strategy. If you care more about the space uh, over here, then e either oversampling or using the original data set uh, might make more sense. Yes, you can combine oversampling and undersampling. And there's like, okay, I'm gonna talk about some much more advanced, like n not much more, but slightly advanced sampling schemes. And um, yeah. So I think I mentioned this last time. Um, so it's really sort of, okay, there, there's not really a consensus about, uh, I think about whether using one or the other metric is better. And as I said, it depends on if you look at this curve, what is actually the, the area you're interested in? Do, we, do I care about high precision? Do I care about high recall? Then uh, the answer is different in terms of what model I would select. Um, in, in general, um, as I said last time, so for the difference between these two is uh, whether you use false positive rate or uh, precision for the axis that's not recall. And so, I mean, the intuition that I gave was basically that the true negatives are always very big and uh, because that's the, the negatives are the majority class and so this kind of distorts the curves. Um, generally, I would basically just say, look at the curves and look at what is more meaningful to you. Is the true positive rate more re meaningful for you or is precision more meaningful for you? And usually I find that precision sort of make, makes a little bit more sense. There's, um, so you might think about this oversampling seems a little bit silly because we're duplicating uh, the same points over and over again, which slows down our training. Uh, we can get the same effect actually, or more or less the same effect by using something that's called class weights. Uh, so instead of repeating the samples, you just tell the model to um, count them double or count them 10 times. That's implemented actually in scikit-learn as the class weight parameter, and it works for nearly all models. So this is this usually, um, th this is the same as basically multiplying 
the existence of all the samples by a constant factor. So here you're not sampling with replacement. You're, I mean, you could do that also, but the standard way to do it is to just um, multiply all the points in the minority class with a factor so that they're as important as, in a, as the majority class. Um, this is, so this is basically the same as oversampling, but it's cheaper because you don't have to actually duplicate the samples. So this is implemented on like a model specific, uh, in a model specific way. So this is implemented in each model, sort of the way it's supposed to be. Um, I just want to give examples here for um, logistic regression and for trees. So here, this is the um, L2 penalized log loss, where again, forgot the B, because I don't like the B. Anyway, um, so this is the standard to penalize log loss. If you want to use class weights, what will end up happening is uh, the data fitting term, which is this first term, will be weighted by a different C that is specific to the class. So CYI means weight depending on the positive class. And this is basically the same as like, if you'd set this to two for one class, it means it's the same as just summing over the same point twice. Um, you can do the same thing in trees. For example, if you're using the Gini index, then uh, you can again put in for e in the term for each class, you can put in a class specific factor that just says count this class more. And then here in this case, in the prediction, um, you would do a weighted vote um, in the tree where you don't just count the samples of each class in the leaf, but you weight them by the class weights. So this is pretty straightforward to implement for most models. Basically just double, double counting some points. Um, so you can give these class weights it's um, by just specifying a dictionary, it goes from class to the class weight, or you can call it with balanced. Balanced basically does the same as the oversampling by default. It makes it it's such that the classes have the same amount, the same amount of effective samples. So it's the same as oversampling at the minority class until it's as big as the minority class. And that's actually something because it's like a very, very simple change and it's basically free in ter compared to not doing it. This is something that most people uh, try out when they work with an imbalanced data set. I guess, yeah, one of the reasons being that we made it so easy was I could learn to do that. Um, so here, Again, and this doesn't, uh, it's a sim very similar to oversampling. It doesn't have a very beneficial effect here. Um, do I have the rock curve? No. But uh, the if I uh, follow the rock curve, the rock curve would be very similar to the oversample one. So if I really care about high precision, this would probably be a good thing to do. Right. Th these are sort of yeah. So, but does that mean in class weights, in effect, you're not actually oversampling? So yeah. The data for twice, you're not doing what we're expecting here at all. Yeah. So, I don't actually oversample. So the data is exactly the same. I just in the loss where I'm, in the optimization, I count the points double. So I don't have to blow up the data set. Right, so these are sort of the most trivial strategies that people can come up with, um, though they're still useful sometimes. Um, one thing that I uh, quite like is, uh, because of the neat idea, is um, ensemble resampling, which is also known as um, imbalanced forest or um, easy ensembles. So we talked about um, ensembles where we built a model on sort of slightly different sample of the data set and average it to uh, reduce the variance. 
it's a very natural thing to combine this with undersampling. So I can um, build a random forest, but instead of each tree taking a bootstrap sample, I can take a random undersample of the data set. This means that here in my case, instead of having 8,000 data points, I'm only going to have 400 data points for each tree. This will make the training much faster. Also, the trees will be less uh, correlated because um, they're built on like completely different samples, in a sense. Well, the minority class will be the same, but the majority class will be different, so I have uh, different samples. So um, this is implemented in Imbalance Learn. We are also going to put this into Cycle Learn hopefully soon. So there's two ways to do this. There's either there's a balanced random forest classifier that they added whoop, that they added recently. So you can just use the balanced random forest classifier that does this internally, or you can do the balanced bagging classifier and do this with any model. So here I'm just using the balanced bagging classifier and put in a decision tree with max features auto. That's basically the same as doing a random forest. But I could also use any other model in this balanced, bag, uh, balanced banging classifier. When I um, f first put this together, I, w uh, I was only looking at uh, the rock score, and I was really happy because this has a way higher rock score than anything else that I tried until that point. But uh, Actually, the, uh, the AUC is not as good. Sorry, the average precision is not as good. The AUC is better, the average precision is not as good at, than the baseline. But again, I think it's um, uh, most informative to look at uh, the whole curves. So you can actually see here in the a precision recall curve. In green, you have the undersampling. Uh, sorry, and in red, you have the easy ensemble. So, actually, if you care about very high recall, that was where undersampling was good, and now the easy ensemble improves un over the undersampling. Again, here this improves over the undersampling. Um, in the high precision area, it's sort of it's somewhat better than the undersampling, uh, but still not as good as the baseline. This is, in general, so this is faster to train than um, the baseline if I have the same amount of trees. Because in the baseline, each tree is uh, built on 8,000 uh, 8, samples. Here, each tree is built on 400 samples. So it's actually uh, pretty decent um, considering. I could, of course, then like add more trees or something like this, but uh, there's too many parameters to tune to actually go through all of this. So this um, is basically just a variant on doing this undersampling, but doing it differently for each uh, tree and ensemble. And you can see that basically for the random forest, it very clearly improves um, over the undersampling in basically all cases. So that's kind of nice. Oh yeah, so the, the computational complexity of this is the same as of the undersample and then build a random forest, right? So the green and the red line, they take the same amount of time, just the red line is much better. So, cool. So the next thing I want to talk about is some data dependent resampling strategies that are Data dependent but model agnostic. Um, I call them smart resampling with the undertitle based on nearest neighbor heuristics from the 70s. So these are actually things um, that are not very commonly used in practice that I wanted to more uh, give an overview of for completeness. Um, so basically, in the 70s, people really liked the nearest neighbor classifier. Um, 
I guess that was before the first time neural networks became popular. So they tried to make the nearest net, uh, neighbor classifier better. And they did this by trying to either remove samples or add samples. And so I'm gonna go over a couple of the strategies that um, people came up with then. Because yeah, now that people use these in the context of imbalanced data sets. So the first one is uh, edited nearest neighbors. Um, so the idea here was to reduce the data set size uh, for nearest neighbors and uh, basically it removes all samples that are misclassified by K and N from the training data. Um, so this clean, or this is sort of the mode, mode, or they have, it has an all mode, which um, removes any point um, from the majority class that has as a neighbor the minority class. So this basically cleans up outliers and boundaries. So here I have like a synthetic data set to, to show what's happening. Um, so here green is the majority class, blue is the minority class, and uh, the small green ones are all the ones that would be misclassified by a K neighbors classifier with like, I think K equal to five, maybe three or five, I'm not, I don't remember. Um, and so basically these points will be removed. And the goal is that this, uh, removing these points will increase the, um, I guess, will probably increase recall of the minority class. Um, and so this is the original data set this is, um, uh, so going back to the mammography data set, this is features three and four. It's the original data set. This is the data set um, with uh, mode, and this is the data set with all. And you can see it removed only very few points actually. Um, so it didn't really change a lot. So this was not gonna be much cheaper. Um, to compute, but well, it's a thing you can try. Actually, if you um, look for logistic regression, the results are basically the same as they are for the baseline, for uh, the random forest. Uh, the AUC is about the same, the average precision is worse. So that's like, okay, not, not very um, successful. Um, there's another strategy which is called condensed nearest neighbors. This iteratively adds points to the data that are misclassified by K and N. This kind of does exactly the opposite of added nearest neighbors, and people use both of them as heuristics. And it's like, that seems sort of counterintuitive to me, um, but uh, okay. So this actually focuses on the boundary and um, removes all the data points that have in the majority class that are far away from the data. One of the benefits of doing this is it usually removes many data points that are redundant in the majority class. So, um, if I do this on our um, mammography data set, they actually re I end up with uh, 500 data points going th down from, what was it, uh, 4,000? Uh, 8,000. So from 8,000, I went down to um, 500, and it's now it's about two to one imbalance. So it's much more balanced than it was before. But just just comparing uh, on, so this is back going to, back to the synthetic data set, comparing class zero, uh, comparing the added nearest neighbors and the condensed nearest neighbors. Yeah, it's like they basically do exactly the opposite. Um, so. Uh, edit nearest neighbors removes everything that's close to, um, or that would be misclassified, and condensed nearest neighbors only adds the points that are misclassified. Um, so here's um, the results for condensed nearest neighbors. 
um, actually, so re removed a bunch of data points. Um, you can see that for the random force, <laughs> the um, rock AOC went up a bit, the average precision went down, um, but it's not as bad as the random undersampling. So in the random undersampling, we, um, the average precision went down quite a bit. Here, the average precision only went down a little bit, uh, even though we removed most of the data again. So this might be a slightly smarter, w smarter way to undersample. So if I want to actually predict for the majority class, then I can't use the condensed mean and right? Just remove a lot of points. Will that be a good job if I want to predict the majority class? I mean, it's probably still going to do a good job. But I mean, it's unclear what you mean by do a good job and predict the majority class, because, uh, be because like, if you look at precision and recall, they're always going to be high no matter what you do, kind of. Well, but if you remove a lot of uh, majority class labels, uh, sorry, majority class data from the training set, then, well, in case when you're, you're seeing less, like, you, you have less data to train for the model for that class, right? Yes. Uh, I mean, so th the comment is, so now I have less tra uh, model, uh, less data to train for that model. Um, sorry. Now I have less. Uh, data for this class to train the model, yes. And um, I mean, so this is, and the goal here is usually not to get better for the majority class, because that's also some, that's not usually something you're very interested in, and it's a little bit unclear how you would measure that. But it's still gonna perform uh, reasonably well. And it's gonna perform better than the undersampling. In the undersampling, we do the same thing, uh, only we are even more aggressive, and we do it just randomly. Here we remove points, but we don't do it randomly, we do it with a strategy. So here this is, um, yeah, works better than the undersampling with about as few data points left over. One of the things though is with both the EN and, and the condensed nearest neighbors, they're both nearest neighbor strategies. And uh, as we l learned in the very beginning, um, Predicting on nearest neighbor strategies can be very expensive. So actually running this condensed nearest neighbor here might be more expensive than training the random forest on the full data set. So it might be a good idea if you really want to compress your data, um, but it might not be a good idea to like speed up your training. Whether it speeds up your training or not will depend a lot on your data set and on your classifier. There's many more different strategies for like smart subsampling or uh, um, oversampling. Um, there's also things that uh, maybe I should have put in, in the direction of active learning where you actually use the, um, the model that you're predicting with. So here, these two strategies were dependent on the data, but they were independent of the model. You could also think about um, changing the data in a model-dependent way. But I think, yeah, but actually this is sort of not that commonly done for dealing with imbalance data. One thing that um, is done in practice is uh, synthetic sample generation. So generally, if you have imbalance data, so if you have in the homework, as I said, you have so much data, you're probably not gonna use all of it, so you can probably just pick 50-50 if you want, or you can pick it imbalanced in some way that you want. But um, you basically have enough data from the minority class, um, at least for the models we're looking at. Uh, here in this case with the uh, mammography data set, we only have, uh, what was it, 180 samples or something in the minority class, so our problem is really, we have too few samples in the minority class, to get better, we need more samples. In the real world, the best thing is, of course, to get out, go out and get more actual data. So the best thing you can do is either annotate more data or collect more data. If you can't do this for some reason, synthetic sample generation um, might be the go-to. One way to uh, generate synthetic samples that I'm actually not going to talk about here. Um, I might talk about more uh, 
sort of towards the end of the semester is data augmentation. You can do domain-specific data augmentation by um, taking a, a data point and modifying it in a way that doesn't uh, change the essence of the data but looks different to the classifier. This is very, very common in computer vision. For most computer vision problems, whether you do a left-right flip of the data or not, of an image or not, doesn't matter. If you have a car and you flip the picture of a car, it's still a car. You can often even rotate a little bit and it's still the same picture. So this is also a way, a way to create a synthetic samples. And so this is actually something that works really, really well in practice because you get uh, new samples without having to label them. What I'm going to talk about today is different in that it's not domain specific, in that it tries to generate new samples just from the data it has, but without any domain knowledge. This is much harder to do. The main technique that um, is famous in this area is called SMOT, which is synthetic minority oversampling technique. And so if, if you have an interview question and uh, you get asked, what do you do with balanced data? They probably want you to answer smote. Whether this is a good answer or not is, is a different uh, question, but this is sort of the main strategy that, uh, or the main heuristic that people use for adding synthetic data. So the point is to oversample the minority class, but not just re replicate points, but um, add synthetic points. So for each sample in the minority class, the way it works is you pick a random neighbor uh, from, K na from their, its k neighbors, so you just set k as say 5, and then you pick one randomly from these 5, and you pick a point on the line connecting these two uniformly. And so this point on the line is unit data point. Actually, I talked with the people that implemented this in, in Imbalance Learn on Friday, and it's kind of interesting. So the implementation in Imbalance Learn does this on uh, the line between the two samples, and that's what's written in the paper. Um, okay, I don't have a picture for this because I heard it on Friday, but I'll try to draw it here, maybe in a way that the video can see it. So what okay, so what imbalance learn does is let's see this is your data point and this is your um, the, the neighbor you sample. What imbalance learn does is it samples points on the line connecting the two. This is what's in the paper. What the Java implementation does is it looks at the rectangle in like hyperspace, whatever, um, that's spanned by these two, and samples randomly within that rectangle. Um, that's kind of weird because it's not rotation variant, because this, this rectangle is axis aligned. Um, they emailed the author and I said, Wh which one is correct? And he's like, whatever. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's a little bit unclear. So it would be interesting to do a benchmark whether one of them is better than the other. He also said, oh yeah, one of them was better than the other, but I don't remember which one. Um, so that's cool. So uh, here my examples are with the imbalance learning implementation, which uh, basically does what's, what it says in the paper and not what it says in the implementation. So here, first to give an idea um, on the synthetic data set, basically we just we add a bunch of points to the orange minority class that is sort of all contained within the convex hull. So if your data set is like a blob, like it is here, then uh, doing this sort of makes a lot of sense, and you get just a bunch of more data points. And it 
uh, by default, you upsample until the tasks are balanced. So here is this, the same on the um, breast cancer data, sorry, the mammography data set. So here, I did again the thing that I mentioned in the beginning where I plot first the purple points and then the yellow points. And so now it looks like there's only yellow points after the smooch, but actually it's just because of the overplotting. And so you can see very clearly that, that um, so there's lots of points added, he added here, and there's like points connecting to this one guy all the way over there, and there's there. Yeah. Yes? Oh. Which label do I choose? Sorry, one one neighbor in the minority class. You only look at the minority class. Oh, so like with the five neighbors that are close to the data, you only access look at the, the yes. that have in this class. Okay. Sorry. That wasn't clear. Um all right, so so we can do this. Um again here on this data set, um for the, the logistic regression model, um, little change on the rock AOC, uh, getting worse on the average precision. Um, with the random forest classifier, getting a bit better on the rock AOC, getting worse on the um, average precision. So, I mean, you can also see that the AOC is pretty unchanged between all of these classifiers most of the time, but the average precision actually uh, fluctuates quite a bit, which might tell us it's more sensitive, or it might tell us it's more noisy. So both of these here, again, th this is like just an, a, a case study for this data set, but neither of these is like very promising. Um, I uh, did a grid search over uh, how many neighbors to use. So this is basically how much uh, fuzz you add. So when I ran it this time around, the um, I guess the maximum was at seven. Last time I ran it, it was at 11. So the next plots are all with uh, using it at 11. So 11 is not the worst choice here either. Uh, probably should have put in some error bars. And so here is a comparison of the default five neighbors and um, my grid search result at some point which was 11 neighbors and you can see it sort of spans with more points so you can see this guy connects to these down here this connects over here and so on but uh, oh. it didn't actually give the results but the results are basically uh, the same as with uh, five neighbors. So here is uh, Smoot with 11 neighbors added to the to the overview of the ROC and PR curves. And um, yeah, I would say it's a wash. Uh, particularly looking at the uh, rock curve, there doesn't seem to be a lot going on. It's mostly dominated by the easy ensemble. Um, here, looking at the uh, precision recall curve, actually, there's areas where it is better than the original, which is not true for most of these algorithms. So you can see that there's uh, some area here where um, it does pretty well. Of course, these are if you look at these curves, these are very noisy. And so there's, it's like um, kind of questionable how much you should tr trust these results and uh, pick a model based on these. So if I look at these, I probably, what I would gonna do, what I would do is uh, use the original data set uh, unless I have or a uh, strong reason not to, to do something else. So this might be different on other data sets, but yeah, it would be nice to have like a really large scale comparison, but I'm not aware of anyone that does this like in a, has done this like really rigorously. 
So I think yeah, the main take, so actually, well, I'm gonna end early today for once. Um, so there's many different variants of smooth, and so this was sort of the basic variant, and people uh, published new papers on how to get better than SMOT. Um, and but it's very unclear whether trying to add uh, data points in this very generic way is actually beneficial. And so some people use it in practice, but I think um, the thing is most commonly used of all of these techniques in practice, the two things are uh, class weight equal to balanced or undersampling. Undersampling is really great because it makes things much faster. In practice, you probably wouldn't undersample until it's balanced. You would undersample um, as much as you can without decreasing the score. So you can go from 1,000 to 1 to 10 to 1, probably without uh, losing much. And again, if you evaluate any of these techniques, it's very important which metric you use. And I would really encourage you to look at these plots, in particular looking at the precision recall uh, plot, and see what is the area that I'm interested in. Where, um, what trade-off do I want to make? Because as we saw, if you look at these summer statistics, they don't really paint a very clear picture. Um, yeah, so uh, the other thing that I didn't add so far is that, um, yeah, so the undersampling together with ensembles uh, is something that people also definitely use in practice, and it's basically, uh, a better way to do undersampling, and the imbalanced random force is like a very popular thing. Um, you can do could do something uh, similar with gradient boosting, and I'm sure someone wrote a paper about it. So it's also obviously a good idea to do the same thing and then do it with gradient boosting, where you have balanced subsamples uh, in each stage of the boosting. And I'm sure this will work great. Um, yeah, these smart sample strategies. I'm not entirely convinced. Very often, these smart sampling strategies are combined with SMOTE in some way or with some other synthetic data generating um, method. But I haven't really seen um, very convincing evidence that they help in general, and they don't seem to be used that much in practice. So, subsampling on ensembles, um, and yeah, really be careful in your metrics, I guess is the main, main takeaway. Questions? The question is, in SMOT, would you use synthetic data to generate more synthetic data? And the answer is no, uh, by default, I think. Like, there are so many variants of all of these that I'm sure someone wrote a paper where they did that. but. Um, by default, you wouldn't do that. All right. So have a happy early Monday or something.